thank you everyone for coming. Uh, today we're having we are having our last virtual tour and we are going all the way to Romania. Um, and our host for today is Chris. Have I, I pronounced the name right, Chris? Um, yeah, almost. <laughs> but it's okay. okay. How's, it, how's it pronounced? Uh, Rollart. Rollart. Okay, that's yeah, hard. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, so, um, there is a lot to learn about Romania. It is a beautiful country. It is a country that we don't, we don't like always get to hear about, hear things about. Well, there is the Dracula that everyone wants to know about. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, but before you start, uh, before you start, Chris, I will um, call back Raphael to give us a brief um, a brief of uh, how far we are and what is expected of us next week. Uh, I will talk in, by the end of the, the webinar. You can awesome. Okay. So, all right. So, Chris, the microphone is back to you. Just give us this cruise. We cannot wait. Okay. Um, can you give me permission to screen share? Rafael? Can you try now? Okay, yeah, it's working. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so can you see this? Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, just, just give me a second. So hello, everybody. Um, before we start, I guess I should introduce myself. So I'm Chris, I'm 18 and I live in Sibiu, Romania. And my favorite quote would be, opportunities multiply as they are seized yeah, yeah. by Sun Tzu. And my role here today is to be your virtual guide, be it uh, Chris. caves, uh, Chris. ruins, so, castles. Chris, Yeah. I'm hearing, um, is it called echo or? Uh, yeah, but I'm not You have sure two devices it. on? I think that might be because of Dr. B's device, but like, now that she's muted, I think it'll be fine. Okay. Okay, uh, sorry, I just fixed it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Continue, please. Okay, so be it castles, ruins, caves, or cemeteries, I'll show you everything. So I hope you'll enjoy this as much as I do. So without for any further ado, let's get started. So uh, where is Romania? Romania is this small country here. Actually, it's not that small, but it looks like a fish. It's here in the e southeastern part of Europe and is the 12th largest country in Europe, actually. And some numerous countries and also it has some uh, natural borders like the Black Sea and Danube. And the bordering countries would be Ukraine, Moldova, Bulgaria and Serbia and Hungary. And geographi ge geographically speaking, it's between the equator and the North Pole. That means that there are four seasons. So in the summer, it's sizzling hot and in the winter, it's freezing cold. Uh, talking about the relief, it has almost all the relief forms. Believe it or not, uh, there's a desert area that has started to expand. Um, and fun fact about it, 50% uh, of the Carpathians are in Romania and also like Danube is the southern natural border. And there are some plains that could be noted. Uh, the Wallachian plain, which is um, around here. The Pannonian uh, plain, which is around here at the nose of the fish. And the Boragan plains. Uh, here in the Baragan, Baragan Plains, uh, people were deported during the, during the communist area to work. And um, other forms of relief would be the Danube Delta, which is around here, at the, uh, uh, near the Black Sea. And like I said, the desert areas that are around here, if you can look closely, near the capital, which is around here. So the first, city, the first thing that I would like to show you would be Bucharest. 
Uh, Bucharest is the largest city in Romania since, and the capital since 1862. And it's also called the Little Paris. Um, it's the cultural, industrial and financial center. And it held, also has a mix of quite some different types of architectures, uh, just like classical, interbellum, communist, and even the modern type of arch architecture. And here are some things I would like to show you. Um, the things that are worth visiting at least once while being in Romania would be the Palace of the Parliament, which is open for tourists. And here, very important decisions are taken here and at the, and the Palace of the where the government is located. The Triumphal Arch, which is a smaller copy of the Arc de Triomphe in uh, France. Uh, Terme Bucharest, which is the largest thermal bath complex in Europe. It's very relaxing. I've been there once. The only downside is that it's a bit expensive, but uh, it's worth the try. Um, the National Museum of Art, uh, which is actually located in the, uh, in the Royal Palace of the ex-Royal -fa Family of Romania. And the Antipa Museum, which is uh, biology and uh, zo and it's a biology a museum. There you can find, uh, um, for example, skeletons. You can find um, tools again, which are quite interesting antique tools that were used that were used in this area of Romania. And here are some pictures um, here, uh, this huge building, it's the uh, Palace of the Parliament. Here is the uh, Triumphal Arc, which like I said, it's the, it's the smaller copy of the one in France. Uh, the Art Museum and the Antipa Museum is right here. You can see a skeleton, or I think it's a mammoth. And I think this one will be the most interesting to start with. This is the Brown Castle. Uh, it's commonly known as Dracula's Castle because it appears in Bram Stoker's book. And I have to uh, let you guys down because uh, Vlad the Impaler, the Impaler, which is the um, the one which uh, the, is which is the historical character that Dr Dracula. Uh, is um, was made on, uh, never actually set foot in this castle. Uh, this, who is this direct, this Vlad the Impaler guy? He looks like this, and he was a very cruel um, ruler in the medieval ages. He's known for uh, his fights with the Ottomans and for his cruelty. What, why is he so cruel? Because uh then he would impel his enemies and not only enemies but also traitors or uh, citizens uh that would be that could uh, be a threat to him and the uh, order for example there's a very interesting story that during his time uh if a pot of gold would be left on the side of the road no one would dare to pick it up because they would they would be scared that they would uh be impaled by this guy um the brown castle was first documented uh the was first mentioned in uh, documents in 1377 by louis the first of hungary uh during that Romania was still a part of hungary uh, this castle played a military strategic role up to, up to the mid 18th century and it had different roles. For example, it was a fortress at first, a royal, a royal residence next and the private museum in the present. Here are some pictures. Um, you can see how it looks like uh, from, from the sky. And you can see some uh, weapons that were used during that time. Uh, here is the interior courtyard, which uh, actually has a well 
that it is said to make wishes come true. So every time I go there, I've been there for about six or seven times. Uh, every time it gets filled with um, coins. Here is the uh, royal crown, which was used by Queen uh, Marie. Uh, Queen Marie was one of the legendary Roman figure, uh, Romanian figures. She was a queen during the uh, First World War. So uh, she was popular for being a nurse. Uh, more than that, she was actually uh, of English descent. And yeah, that's why she was popular, because she was a nurse during the uh, First World War. And after the First World War, uh, she helped Romania gain uh, recognition at the uh, Treaty of Paris. Um, and yeah, here are some other pictures. This one above in the right corner is her um, room where she lived uh, when she was at the residence. And here is what it looks like at the, um, at the bottom of the uh, hill, because this castle is made on a hill. Uh, next up would be uh, this is the, the ancient capital of the Dacian, uh, of the Dacians. Now, just like any other country, uh, Romania wasn't always called Romania. I think you would expect that. But uh, in the uh, ancient times, it was called uh, Dacia. And San Misegetuza was its um, capital uh, during 82 BC and 106 AD. Uh, this place uh, is built on top of a one th on a 1200 meter high mountain. I've been there and it takes quite a lot uh, to get there even by car. Uh, I think that I should tell you something about the construction. So the fortress was formed by a massive stone was formed by massive stone blocks. Uh, there was also a sacred zone. It was actually a circular sanctuary. It was surrounded by circular poles. This one in the back. The back. Uh, some people say that it looks uh, weirdly, weird, weirdly close enough to the Stonehenge. Uh, the only difference I know of is that uh, it's made out of oak poles. And there was also a sundial uh, referred to as the Andesite sun. And uh, the civilians during that time lived below the citadel uh, in settlements built on artificial terraces. Um, the Dacians were known for uh, having advanced medical uh, knowledge. So advanced medical tools were found at the site as well as different types of metalwork because they were also skilled in that one. So sights, sickles, hoes, rakes, picks, uh, spare points, daggers, and other types of weapons were also found there. Um, so I have to say this thing. Uh, being there is quite invigorating. Revigorating. The, uh, there is, I don't know how to explain it, but there is a different aura to that whole place. So when you go there, you fear you, you feel invigorated and you just feel very good. And one more thing, there's a conspiracy that there are tunnels that were used for hiding beneath the, uh, beneath the capital. And there was also a saying that there is some, uh, some kind of treasury uh, under which contains, uh, contains gold or sil silver, but nothing about that was made, uh, was shown to the, to the people. So I think it's just a conspiracy. So here in the left upper corner is the Andesit sun, the sundial, like I told you. And this weird uh, statue, it's actually the Dacian um, flag. And it depicts a wolf head on top of a serpent's uh, body. 
and it was it looks this weird because um, the Dacians would use it in order to scare their enemies and also in uh, order to boost their own troops morale. Um, and there are some here are some other pictures of um, the uh, the sanctuary. And here, usually, there would be some kind of rituals done and other types of uh, stuff. Uh, I think that I should tell you how uh, Romania came, came to be. So uh, back then, um, the Dacians were, have, were, uh, were having wars with the Romans. There were actually two wars. And the first one ended in a peace treaty between the Romans and the Dacians. And uh, the second one uh, was won by the Romans because uh, while they, while um, fighting, there was a betrayal by one of the local noblemen who cut the water lines. And because the water lines were cut, uh, the, Dacian, the Dacian population at that place uh, at that time didn't have uh, water and they started to starve, started to die of thirst and generally ju were just scared and had to run away. And while run running away, the last king of um, Dacia uh, decided to commit suicide uh, in order to not submit to the Romans. To the Romans. And that guy's name was Decebalus. And here is one of the statues of him. Uh, like I said, De Decebalus was uh, the last king of Dacia and he's actually a legendary figure in, uh, for us. So here is a statue made uh, of hey, him. Chris, uh, just a yeah? curiosity that I have. Uh, do Romanians call Romania as Romania? I, I'm asking that because in Japan, uh, the population don't call Japan as Japan, they call it as Nippon. But for Romanians, oh. you call it as Romania? Yeah, yeah, we call it as Romania. And do you know why is it called Romania? Well, um, so after the wars with the Dacians, uh, the Roman legion, the, Roman, the Romans started to uh, populate this area and they started to mix together with the Dacians. So because um, our, our population is actually uh, half Dacian and half Romanian, uh, half Roman, uh, our name comes from the Romans okay. because, yeah, they settled here. Okay, thank you. So, uh, any other questions? I, I would like to answer to any if there are. Um, there was one that was uh, asking why um, why the capital city of Romania is, is, the, um, is called the uh, Little Paris, but I answered it. So let's oh. continue. Okay. Um, so, um, just a quick question. Do you guys see the screen with the presentation or do you also see the black screen? Like no, no, we see the presentation. Okay, so uh, the sculpture of Decibalus was is a colossal carving, and it was made between the years 1994 and 2004, which is quite recent. It was made by a total of 12 sculptures, and it's the tallest rock relief in Europe. It has 55 meters height and 25 meters width and uh, it was made by hand. Um, this statue is located in the Danube's big boilers. So to uh, explain to you what the big boilers are, uh, they are the place where the Danube's way is narrowed by the mountains. And because it's narrowed, the power of the water increases and it creates bubbles, giving the impression that the water is boiling. And here are some pictures of that one. Mm, so on the left side, um, you can see how it looks like. Here at the beginning, it's starting to narrow. 
actually the Danube is much larger. So because it's narrow like this, the uh, uh, the bubbles are created. And here you can see how the statue looks like from afar. And also, I, as far as I know, you can go for a tour on the water. It's quite relaxing, actually, I've heard. Unfortunately, I've never been there, but I love to go there. And here is a picture of a monastery. And I believe that there are, there are still being uh, people who take care of it. And I think that every Sunday they uh, hold the rituals. So because we were talking about the Danube, here is the Danube Delta, which is quite famous. It's a uh, natural form, uh, like uh, really to the far, uh, to the far uh, southeast of the country. And it's formed, by, it's formed by the Danube River before flowing into the Black Sea. It's the second largest and best preserved of, of Europe's delta. And it, because of that, it hosts 300 species of birds and 45 freshwater fish species. For example, we have birds like pelicans, wild duck, ducks, rats, and other, and other ones. And for fish, we have carp, stench, uh, breams, perch, and a lot of other ones that I didn't really manage to find. Um, so how did the Danube Delta form and how it looks like? So basically, it's made out of alluvial land. Which, uh, that means that it's mo all mostly covered by wetlands and water. It consists of marshes, marshes channels, streamlets, and lakes. And it started forming some 4,000 4, years ago. Uh, and I've also read an article that 40% of it uh, only started to form uh, in the last 1,000 years. And how it started, um, uh, the Danube comes with all kinds of uh, mud and dirt and other particles. And because the water uh, because where the um, uh, Black Sea starts, the water starts to uh, slow down. The mud gets the time in order to uh, settle down. So uh, all these islands and lakes were formed because of that mud and other particles of, uh, for example, dirt. So that's how uh, the Delta came to be. And because uh, it's has different types of ecosystems and different types of uh, fauna and flora, uh, different types of, uh, for example, just like you see birds like pelicans and uh, that and uh, that kind of birds uh, settled down there. It's quite rich, um, yeah, it's quite a rich area of even though it's the least populated um, by humans uh, area in uh, Romania. I think it has only like uh, uh, 20,000 people that live in near, nearby in other cities and in the port. And more than that, it's listed in, as a World Heritage Site. And here are some pictures. You can see how it looks like uh, from afar, from the sky. Here are some ducks which Annette told me that uh, they look incredible. Um, here are some pelicans. And yeah, basically, I know that uh, you can take a tour there. I'm not sure how much it would cost. Uh, they would take you around there and you can see how and you can, yeah, basically you can feel how the nature actually feels because uh, this is, um, this is so uh, uh, isolated from the whole modern and developed places that uh, it has different type of air. It's very clean. And unfortunately, I've never been there. But again, I would really love to go there because it looks amazing. I love the way these ducks love, look. Please just go back to the ducks. Um, like their yellow beaks. I just like the way they're coordinating their yellow beaks plus their black necks and their mm -hmm. um their orange like um what are they called legs and 
the whole white wing is just amazing, spectacular. Let's continue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So here start the caves and the salt mines. Uh, Salina Turda is a salt mine in Turda, which is the second largest city in the Cluj County. A Cluj County is one of the biggest uh, student cities. So most of the students go there to study if they want to study in Romania. And the Salina Turda was first mentioned in uh, 1075. Uh, it's actually, uh, right now it's an uh, indoor museum of old mining devices, as well as it has some recreational spaces. It was open to tourism uh, since 2010, and it has great uh, uh, benefits for your health. Actually, people go there for therapy most of the time because it boosts immunity. And if you have uh, respiratory problems like pneumonia or asthma, you can go there and it actually helps you. And it also helps you with allergies. So what, what was the purpose of this whole salt mine? So uh, in the medieval times, people uh, took the salt from here and it was usually uh, used to cook the food of the feudal lords in the medieval times. Uh, as far as I know, you can also order something to eat there with the, with the salt made in that salt mine. I've heard that it's, uh, it has uh, different tastes uh, because, of this, because the salt is fresh and it's directly taken out of there. Um, here, are, here again are some pictures of how it looks outdoor, but I'm, I don't think that you would really like to know what it looks outdoor. Uh, it's more interesting to see what's inside. And so under that, um, under that, there's a mechanical device. I've wrecked my brains trying to understand how it works, but this whole wooden um, device was, um, <clears throat> was operated by two horses and it was Eight. Um, and meanwhile, uh, something would uh, take, would, would drill the salt from beneath. Uh, that's how I understand that it works. Uh, and, you, and there you can see other types of these kinds of devices. Uh, they are still there and they look quite old, but at the same time, uh, they look amazing because you can see how uh, things work like, worked like uh, in other times. Here, um, so to, to help you understand, the sound is made different types of levels. Uh, this is the lowermost level and it's actually a salt lake and you can take a boat. I've been there once with my friends and I've almost capsized, which was quite a fun experience. Um, here uh, are the steps. Uh, that you the stairs that you have to take in order to get into the into the uh, salt mine it's very uh, deep so it will take like 15 minutes to uh, go there from the surface and the more you go inside the colder it gets so i would really suggest if you ever come here to take some really uh, thick clothes so that you won't freeze to death because I've seen those people and uh, they couldn't really have any fun because they went unprepared. And here are some other uh, pictures. This is the recreational space uh, and you have a wheel and I've been there. And although it's quite slow, it's very relaxing and you can see uh, how the salt mine looks like. At least this level, you can see how it looks like. Um, other types of caves that we have, uh, this one is also one of the most famous in our country. It's called the Cave of the Bears, and it was discovered in 1975. So you might ask yourself why it's called the Cave of the Bears. It's called like that because uh, when it was discovered, uh, 140 bear skeletons were discovered there. Um, and these kinds of bears would, are actually the cave bear. 
And these cave bears became extinct during the glacial era when the temperature has fallen uh, significantly. So they retreated to their caves and died there. So uh, you have to understand that uh, from that time on, until 1975, it hasn't been known of. So it's been sealed like that. And it was actually discovered because Nearby, um, people were working in order to open a mine that was then closed. So they used dynamite. And because of the explosions, um, the path inside of this cave also uh, was opened. So the Cave of the Bears it may, is made up of four galleries. The first one is the Candles Hall, and you can actually see this one in the background. Uh, it's called like that because the formations start going from the ground to, to the above, and you can see how they look like candles. Um, it's actually quite interesting. Then there is the Emil Rakovica Hall. Uh, it's only for professionals and special equipment is needed because usually people go there for studies or research and that kind of stuff. And that's where the name comes from because Emil Rakovica was actually a quite famously a researcher in Romania. Then there's the spaghetti hole and it looks like that because these kinds of formations uh, start from above and they look just like uh, spaghetti. And the bones hall, the bones hall, uh, they are they're usually um, are bones and skeletons of, just like I said, the bear that became extinct and died there. And more than that, there are a lot of gorgeous stalagmite formations. And here are some pictures. Hey, so Chris, we have... On the left, Sorry, we have two questions for from the Wani. Uh, how long okay. would this cave be in meters? And uh, are all the four galleries at the depth or each one gets deeper? Okay, so uh, first of all, I'm not sure how long is in kilometers, but it took me at least two hours to take a tour which was uh, walking straight from the end, from the beginning to the end, because there are two entrances. So I hope that answers your questions, your question around, it takes around two or three hours, depending on you, on your, and your walking speed. And uh, yeah, the, the halls, uh, they are one, they go one by one and it's in order of the depth. I think that the first hall you encounter is the hall of the bones, which is this one. And from there uh, come the other halls. Okay, thank you. Another. Okay. Um, so yeah, here are some pictures of how it looks like inside. Uh, it looks gorgeous and I've been there. And yeah, here are the spaghetti hall, the spaghettis that start from the uh, from above and come down. Uh, here is actually a water uh, formation. I think it's just like a lake, but it's not that deep. Here are the um, um, the skeletons of the bear. I think it looks quite small. And again, these are the um, the candles from the candles hall. So what's fun about this is that uh, it's not the height of the of the cave is not constant. So it would usually be a very tall uh, place, or you would have to crouch in order to get by. Uh, also, at some places is, it gets narrow. So yeah, that maybe that's why because what well, that's why it takes quite a lot of time to st from the start to the end. So yeah, usually it would take two to three hours, just like I said. And yeah, it's gorgeous. Uh, the next uh, thing that I would like to show you is the Mary Cemetery. And why it's called like that? First of all, the Mary Cemetery is. Uh, in the northernmost part of Romania. 
uh, next to the border to, with uh, Ukraine. And it's famous for its brightly colored tombstones. Uh, it's actually an open air museum and the national tourist attraction. And um, these colored tombstones have a connection to the Dacian culture and philosophy. And it's just like, and it's as follows. Uh, the Dacian culture believed in death, uh, well, believed that death was a, mama, a moment filled with joy and anticipation. And it's a time when you start hoping for a better life for the deceased. So that's why uh, they colored, uh, the people co colored the tombstone just like that. Um, yeah. In 1935, uh, the first tombstone appeared, and by 1916, there were more than 800 crosses to be seen. And I've actually found a funny epitaph, and I'd really love to um, to read it to you because when I showed it to she started laughing. So under this heavy cross lies my poor mother-in-law. Three more days should she have lived. I would lie and she would read this cross. You who here are passing by, not to wake her up, please try. Because if she comes back home, she'll scold me more. But I will surely behave so she'll not return from the grave. Stay here, my dear mother-in-law. Uh, so these are, this is an example of the texts that are written on the tombstones. Uh, there are even more uh, funny texts text on the tombstones um yeah and here are some uh pictures uh it actually looks like this it's very colorful and you wouldn't really feel like you're in a in a cemetery because yeah it's different from the other cemeteries which are uh gloomy and i've ne i haven't been there but my sister has and she told me that it's quite a surprising sight because uh, she didn't feel like she was in a cemetery at all. And yeah, she was fascinated of how, how it looked like. And uh, yeah, you can see how uh, there are quite a lot and uh, how there are different depictions on the tombstones. I believe that this one was from someone that died during a world war. And he, this one, this uh, tombstone is of the creator of the uh, cemetery. And I also have here some other uh, sites. So this one is the Red Lake. Uh, it looks quite creepy and eerie. So I would like to explain about it. The Red Lake was at first a village where people lived. And uh, there are two stories on how uh, the water got there. The first one is that um, the, uh, the, bar the barrage uh, next to the uh, city uh, was destroyed because of natural reasons. So, because maybe it was too weak or something like that. So water started pouring down and it flooded the village and because the people died at the time uh, the water took a red color because of their of their blood so that's why it's called the red lake and another story would be that uh, during that time um, uh, the village wasn't needed there so the dictator, uh, the dictator wanted to flood it and actually flooded it uh, after uh, moving the um, the people out of the city, of, out of the village. Uh, and you can see how um, how the how the um, pi uh, pylons are still there. These are both pylons of uh, the village of the house stru structures and trees and there's also a quite a creepy story that sometimes you can hear how the a bell from the old church uh bells and sings 
And uh, yeah, some people say that they can hear uh, the sound coming and they are creeped out. So uh, it became quite a folk story, there, which is told uh, whenever people go there and visit it. Under it is the bar, which is the old women. Uh, this uh, structure, this formation is actually made naturally uh, because of the <clears throat> because of, of natural reasons, for example, uh, wind or rain or storms and that kind of uh, uh, and that kind of phenomenons. And it actually depicts some old women. This uh, mushroom like, stones are actually the old women which uh, sit and gossip. Uh, it's actually um, uh, it's actually a Romanian thing to say so. Uh, whenever you go in small villages, you would see uh, old women, uh, at least three or four women gossiping about different different things uh, in the village. Uh, when I, when I was uh, little, I also lived in a smaller city, not really a village, but a smaller city. But I would all, always see some uh, groups of old women gossiping and talking about different types of topics. And uh, this one on the Chris, right. Can we, say, can we say that old women were strategizing? I don't think yeah. they were gossiping. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's continue. <laughs> Um, this, on, this one on the right, it's the Sphinx. Uh, so there's a Sphinx in Egypt, which is, is, which is uh, man-made, and there's a smaller Sphinx in um, Romania. And it looks like, and it's called like that because it looks like a person. And uh, you can see how this is like a head and you have eye, it has eyes, a nose and a mouth. And here's the chin. Uh, it was also made by uh, ne by uh, natural methods like uh, snow, like snow or rain or wind or other natural phenomena. It's actually quite uh, close to the Babele, to the old women. Uh, they're on the same mountain. It's called the Buchej Mountain, which is the short one of the shortest mountains in uh, Romania. So um, this is all for my uh, my tour. I really hope you enjoyed it, and I really hope if you have some questions that I could answer. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I have one question. Mm -hmm. So um, for the the cave bit where you where you spoke about those caves. Um, so like, are there any other caves in Romania which have like um, stone paintings? Okay. Like mm -hmm. the uh, so none of the caves in Romania, at least none that I know of, have uh, paintings in them. Uh, but yes, there are a lot of other caves and a lot of other salt mines. Uh, there's one a little bit uh, like it's quite far from where I live. And uh, I remember having to go by car inside. They actually have a bus that takes you deeper down. Um, there's also uh, another cave, just like the Cave of the Bears. I don't really remember its name, but it's also quite long. And it has a lot of those formation, uh, even though it's a bit, un it's less popular than the Cave of the Bears. There are still a lot of them. I have a question for you, Chris. When I lived in Europe, um, it was at a time where Tchaikovsky was your dictator. And it was also okay. at a time where that there was a transition from um, being a communist country under the Soviet Union to mm -hmm. um, you know what you guys have now, which is independence, right? So yeah. as, a, as an 18 year old growing up post Tchaikovsky, so I'm assuming that he died before you were born, correct? Because he was yeah. shot in the firing squad. So what kind of stories do you have from the time of communism? Because, I mean, you were born in a free country. 
But yeah. as you know, Romania became a communist country post-World War II and did not become independent until um, early 90s, I believe. And it, that's a good 40, 50 years of communism. So what, what do you know about that era? So uh, there are mixed opinions actually about the communist era. <clears throat> uh, some people praise it because the because they didn't lack anything and the, the always and every almost everybody was employed and the um and they they weren't the country wasn't in debt at that time so they praise it for that some other people uh complain about those times because they felt like they weren't free and they also uh complained about the uh, rations because at the time you couldn't buy like you want you can buy stuff now you had you actually had a limited amount of uh items that you can buy um yeah like i said there are mixed opinions and i always hear about stories about how the uh, revolution started in 1989 uh, so, yeah, some people say that there were a lot of brave people that wanted to change something. And uh, there are a lot of people who say that uh, the revolution wasn't really a revolution, but a rebellion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, from my what, point of view. Yeah, what do you what do your grandparents say about it? Because now your grandparents were the ones who lived through communism and the Iron Curtain and then had to go through that revolution. So uh, I don't really remember uh, my grandparents talking much about it, but I do remember that my mother was a teenager at the time. She mm -hmm. was like 14 when the revolution started. And right when the revolution started, she came back from skiing so um, she says that it wasn't that bad for teenagers at the time. I don't really believe her, but uh, that's what she thinks because she didn't really lack anything and she could uh, go on vacations quite cheaply, even though they were to Soviet countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I know. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, fun fact about this one, uh, the dictator was actually shot on the Christmas day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's and, not really a fun fact, but it's a fact. Yeah. But both him and his wife, correct? Uh, yeah, I remember. I th yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Because what I remember was in 1991, when the borders opened between Germany and uh, Romania, I was living in Germany. Mm -hmm. And the principal of the, the preschool, the kindergarten that my children went to was Romanian. Mm. And uh, she was like, okay, the borders are now open. And she was um, helping with an orphanage in Romania. And uh, what she did is she took a school bus and she filled it with everything she could get to get it to the, to the border and then to give it to the orphanage. And um, like fundamental things like diapers, formula, food, um, beds, cribs, things like that they needed at the orphanage, you know? Yeah, so, well. Uh, yeah, in that. So that's, that was, a, a, to me, that was a, a very um, significant memory because, you know, she, she was talking about how there were a lot of children in orphanages at that time. Yeah, the opening of the borders was like quite a phenomenon uh, because, first of all, a lot of people fled from Romania because it was a lot of instability. And also, uh, there was a lot where there was, a, you know, people uh, got the taste of new because a lot of new things started coming to Romania. Uh, and everyone was crazy about, wow, how nice this is, even though these were normalities for other countries. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. 
So one question about the because you mentioned about the architecture in Romania. So you mentioned that it's uh, like um, communist style architecture, and so like one of the things they had is constructivism. So, but you also mentioned that like there's a lot of Roman influence. So, I mean, is the architecture in Romania like generally quite contrasting? On one hand, you have like Roman style architecture, and on the other, you have something like more modern, like constructivism, or is it generally monotone? uh well uh it solely depends on the area because for example like i said um the st the biggest student city is made by the romans so there's quite a lot of uh roman influence roman style influence there uh but yeah so actually there are for for huge cities like bucharest and timisoara there are a lot of monotone uh, buildings that were made during the communist era, but there are also quite um, beautiful uh, buildings like churches or castles that were made during uh, the medieval era. So to answer your question, yeah, they, they are quite by type. So. You wouldn't only see one type of architecture in a city, but multiple types. So it's not very monotonous. Uh, is, there, is there any other question? I was actually going to just uh, maybe uh, wrap it up. It was an amazing uh, tour. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I know you already have fans who would want to come and visit, the, especially the Salena Tulda. That is the Leon, Emily. Actually, Emily wants to shift and I'm, go to the Emil Hall. I'm ready to hall. move there. I'm ready to move the Emil <laughs> Hall. It's, it has my name in it. It has my name. So I'm there. I'm there. I'm done. That's it. <laughs> so in the Bear Caves, Emily will just move to the Bear Caves. Yep. Then, um, well, that's. Uh, that's what's beautiful about you know um, our community right our our uh, ex-culture community you guys can start planning visits at once you know all the borders open you guys can go exactly. visit each other you have friends yeah. now you know and I, that's what i do whenever i'm in europe i call all my friends and i say i have four days that i'm going to be in this country would you like to do something and and that and can i tell you like what chris showed us of his country, you would never get in a normal tour because you're seeing it through the eyes of so somebody who's lived there and who's in that culture. It's so much more special when you, know, you can visit all of these countries through your friends. That's the whole yeah. point of Academy. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so I will uh, <laughs> we'll just give Rafael a few minutes. I know we, we are wrapping it up to just uh, give us the update of where we are currently as uh, with regards to our expectations to the, I mean, the students and uh, where we are going, what is expected of us the following week. Yes, Rafael, you can take it up from here. Hey, thank you, Annette. Thank you, Chris, for your presentation. Yeah, for this next week, you guys are going to start to work on the final report. So make sure to submit it by next Friday. So make sure to remember because it's not Sunday this week, it's Friday, okay? And for the next weekend, next Saturday, we will have a post-reflection meeting. So I hope you join us. Not only we will want to hear uh, how do you guys felt about the problem, how do you guys uh, don't know what you learn, everything, and also we'll be teaching you on how to create a post-reflection paper. And for the next week, uh, the next one, uh, you guys are, it's not over. You guys are going to start on a video presentation. So you guys will explain uh, how you build, build your reports. And the best, what, the best videos will be actually be invited to present to uh, university uh, professors, coaches, and also a couple of CEOs of the companies, okay? So that's it. Uh, thank you everyone that joined us today. 
and I hope to see you next weekend. Bye bye. Bye.